Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 296th episode, we have a bunch of news including ankylosaur brains and more details about Dilophosaurus Mm. from a pretty good review paper. And we have dinosaur of the day, Daemonosaurus. But before we get into all of that, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. This week, we have a brand new Ankylosaurus patron, and that's Stego Steve. Nice alliteration. Yeah, that's a good name. And our drawing winners for the rest of the shoutouts are Trent Carbajal, Neil Ovenator, Daniel McGill, Greg, Verosaraptor, Rhinosaurus, James Pasco, Christine, and Paula Canthus. Yay, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate all of your support and being able to chat with you in our Discord and sharing on our Patreon and watching movies together has been really great. We love this community. So if you want to join, then check out our page at patreon.com slash inodino. So before we get into the news, we have a quick update from a previous news article, which is sort of a piece of news in and of itself, which is a retraction, which was posted by Nature. It's a retraction of the report of oculodentivus, or oculodentivus, alternatively, which we reported back in episode 280. It's the quote-unquote hummingbird-sized dinosaur. And at the time when we reported it, we mentioned that there were several people that thought it looked more like an early gecko relative than a dinosaur. And we mentioned that there was a little bit of controversy. And I think we even said, we think it looks a little bit more like a gecko than a dinosaur. And its name, Oculodentivus, combines eye, teeth, and bird. So obviously they thought that it was a dinosaur because it has bird in the name, as a lot of those bird-like dinosaurs do. But the reason that it combined eye and tooth, as a quick reminder, is because it had unusually large eyes and the teeth were much farther back in the jaw than you see in dinosaurs. So there was only one other dinosaur, I think it was Ichthyornis, which is kind of a weird dinosaur in and of itself, that had a tooth below its eye. Usually they stop far farther forward in the snout, basically. But this one had them going way back, like several teeth behind where the eye socket was, which is more like something you see in other lizard type reptiles or squamates or things like geckos. So it did seem at the time that maybe the simplest explanation was that this was more of a gecko type lizard than a dinosaur. But it's still a little bit unclear if that's the way that the researchers are heading because in their official retraction, it's just two sentences long. They said, we, the authors, are retracting this article to prevent inaccurate information from remaining in the literature. Although the description of oculodentivus remains accurate, a new unpublished specimen cast doubt upon our hypothesis regarding the phylogenetic position of HPG 15-3. So there's only been speculation that I've seen online about what this unpublished specimen that they're referring to may be and why it's casting so much doubt on it. I think there's probably enough evidence just in the piece that they published on that skull that looks like it might not be a dinosaur skull (laughs) alone that maybe is a good enough reason to not have it phylogenetically in dinosauria. But we'll have to wait and see what this unpublished specimen that they're referring to is. And in addition to that, they're probably wanting to retract the name Oculodentivus because they were calling it HPG 15-3, which is the collection name. So they're not even saying regarding the phylogenetic position of Oculodentivus. (laughs) They're going back to the name of just the specimen. So I'm expecting to see a new name for this dinosaur slash not dinosaur in the future. Could be a while though. Yeah. And another thing... There was some speculation as well that maybe it got retracted because there was a backlash against using Burmese amber. We talked about it at the time and how this is in a war-torn area and there's been a lot of pushback on researching it at all. SVP has said that they don't think people should be researching this amber because there are just human rights issues at stake. But based on their statement, it doesn't sound like that's why they retracted it. I am curious, though, if maybe some of the researchers that might have been able to shed some light on this being a gecko-like squamate weren't willing to review this paper because of that controversy, and maybe that led to some of this misunderstanding in the first place. It's hard to say. It's all speculation at this point. Yeah. We just know it's retracted. 
Mm-hmm. So Oculu Dentivus is no more. It still has a Wikipedia entry, but officially it's HPG 15-3 until it gets a real name again. So jumping into the new news, <laughs> our first article is the new review of Dilophosaurus and a description based on five really good finds of Dilophosaurus. It was written by Adam Marsh and Timothy Rowe and published in JVP. I don't think Adam Marsh is related to Othniel Charles Marsh, but I'm not sure about that. It'd be a fun coincidence if he was. It would be. Also, several <laughs> generations. I didn't notice it until I was reading some articles about this, and they would it would say, like, Marsh said. I'm like, wait, Marsh? How is he involved with this? Oh, wait, that's, that's the lead author's name. Where's Cope? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What did Cope think? <laughs> so in this article, I think what it is is Marsh's thesis while getting his PhD, and then the other author is his advisor, I believe. And the paper really gets deep into Dilophosaurus. It includes a redescription of the holotype, as well as some previously undescribed specimens, and then some well-known ones that are quite complete already. Nice. Yeah. So as a quick reminder, Dilophosaurus was about 20 feet or 6 meters long, some places say 23 feet or 7 meters, and it didn't have a frill or spit venom (laughs) like it did in Jurassic Park that hypothesis seems to have sort of come from the idea that maybe Dilophosaurus had a weak bite, so maybe it relied on poison or something as a way to eat. But anyway, there's no evidence of that. It was much larger, but didn't have a frill or venom that we know of. It is technically, theoretically possible that it had it, but usually in science, you want to base things on evidence, and there's no evidence of it. So we're going to say it doesn't have that. It was, however, the largest predator in the early Jurassic of North America. And when I say early Jurassic, I mean really early Jurassic. This is like 195 million years ago, like just a couple million years after the Triassic ended. There's only one named species, which is Weatherly. And the species was named in 1954 after a Navajo counselor, but it was included in the genus Megalosaurus, was doing that whole wastebasket taxon thing that we've talked about before because there are lots of things that have been thrown into Megalosaurus over the years. But in 1970, the genus Dilophosaurus was coined and it became Dilophosaurus weatherly. The first important detail of this new paper is that they support Dilophosaurus weatherly being the single species of Dilophosaurus. So they looked at all these different individuals and they didn't see any reason to split out a new species. So big review papers like this often end with like, we have a new Dilophosaurus species, or we've got a new genus that they're splitting off from Dilophosaurus. But in this case, it looks really similar. There's not a lot of variability between the individuals. So they support it being just one species. I think there have been a couple of papers that maybe thought there should be some splitting happening, but I couldn't find any other names being suggested. So I think that was pretty early phases of hypothesizing. They emphasized that even in different geological layers, it appears that the species is very similar as well. So it's not like Taurosaurus and Triceratops, where the argument can be in these lower levels, you have one species, and in the higher levels, you have a different species because they're a million or two years apart. Even if they are a couple million years apart in Dilophosaurus's case, they all look like the same species, which is pretty cool. Phylogenetically, Dilophosaurus sits in an early neotheropod but not as a ceratosaur or coelophysoid. So basically what that means is it's a really early dinosaur that is weird (laughs) and doesn't fit into most of the other groups that we've named. Its closest relatives that came out in their analysis was Cryolophosaurus, which was from the same time. It was about the same size, but it was in Antarctica. And it had a crest at the back of its head, kind of going perpendicular to the length of the snout whereas Dilophosaurus obviously have the, has those two crests running down the snout. So overall, it's kind of similar. You can see why they'd be related. But the other one's a little weirder. Zupasaurus is the other one that came out as the closest relative. That one is 10 to 20 million years earlier, which puts it pretty firmly in the late Triassic. It's also significantly smaller at maybe half the size of Dilophosaurus, and it's way down in Argentina with much smaller crests, if any, on mm-hmm. its skull. So this one's quite a bit different. It's interesting. Yeah. Although late Triassic, it makes sense that it's smaller. Yeah, very true. We also have a couple new details about its head crest that came out in that paper. 
They talk about how they were air filled, similar to modern hornbills, <laughs> which is it's interesting looking at these different pictures of birds. I didn't think about it, but they have this big like air filled thing on top of their bill. At least some species oh, of them yeah. do. And Dilophosaurus really looks pretty similar to that in these reconstructions. Like a toucan. Yeah. The other thing they compare it to is a cassowary with the cask on top of its head, but kind of a pair of them running down the side of Dilophosaurus's snout instead. The crests at this point are still probably most likely for species recognition. They don't seem to have any other specific uses, at least that we've discovered so far. And they stretch from nearly the tip of the snout to behind the eye. So they're very long, covering quite a bit of the head. And they call them nasolacrimal crests is the official name for them. If you want to sound smart at a party, you can talk about Dilophosaurus and its nasolacrimal crests. <laughs> All right. Nice. <laughs> they're called that because it goes over the nasal bone and the lacrimal bones. So that was, yeah, that was going to be my guess. Yeah. But I can't see this coming up too often at parties, though. It, it will if I'm there. Mm, I see. <laughs> And it's kind of interesting that it covers both of those bones because in a lot of dinosaurs, the crests don't cover lots of different bones in the head. They just kind of sit over just one, like say just over the nasal or something. So yeah, it's a pretty special crest that Dilophosaurus had. It's also presented with a very impressive height in the paleo art. The authors say the crests, quote, were almost certainly covered with keratin or keratinized skin, end quote. And as we've talked about before, a lot of times one of the benefits to having keratin over bony tissue is you can make it stick out more because it's kind of like a fingernail growing over it. So you can really emphasize those big Dilophosaurus frills on your snout by growing up that big fingernail type structure higher. Garrett's doing a lot of really great hand gestures to go with this. <laughs> sort of like a mohawk is what I'm imagining, like pushing my hair up into a mohawk. <laughs> That's basically what Dilophosaurus was doing with the keratin going around the bone. Or basically what cassowaries do today. You see that keratin going up on their cask as well. In other parts of the body, they found that the rest of the skeleton had a lot of pneumaticity, as well as indicating that it had big air sacs. This means that there were bird-like respiratory systems way back at least 195 million years ago with Dilophosaurus which is pretty cool. And the air pockets didn't seem to weaken the bones significantly based on their structure. It seems like they had that kind of honeycomb-like feature to them. So the same kind of advantages we talk about with modern bird bones and how they're still pretty strong, even though they are very lightweight. They also had good grasping abilities with four fingers on each hand. So they would have been a, a pretty fearsome, graspy predator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And Brian Eng has a few posts on his Patreon based on this research as well. There's a really great puppet he made for the St. George Dinosaur Discovery Site in Utah. And they made a video where it's like walking in the sand and you can see its head with its big, amazing crests and everything. And there's also an upcoming exhibit for the Las Vegas Natural History Museum, which incorporates these extra large crests and other features based on this new research. So if you're either in Utah or nevada and you're able to go to museums when you hear this <laughs> yeah you might be able to check out some of these new depictions and we haven't been to st george dinosaur discovery site yet but we have been to las vegas natural history museum and that's a pretty fun one yeah it is it's cool it's my preferred type of museum because it's kind of hole in the wall style mm -hmm. where when you go in you often have the place to yourself or at least we did when we went and i think we went on a weekend too it wasn't like a very it wasn't that unusual of a time to go. Right. But there's always so much going on in Vegas. <laughs> there is. It's a, I think it's even on the Strip, but it's like down the road a little bit. Oh, I thought it was away from the Strip. We had to take a taxi or yeah. something. To it was get pretty there. close, though. It wasn't that far away. When we were there, they had an Archaeopteryx exhibit, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I remember our driver was surprised that we were going to this museum. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was a little bit worried about getting a taxi back. <laughs> 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 this often happens, though, when we go somewhere and we end up visiting the natural history museums. Yes. It was easier in Las Vegas than it was in, like, Japan, for sure. Yeah. Oh, I meant people being surprised that that's where we're going. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and as promised, we also have a new study on the brain of an ankylosaur. So 
This new study is of two complete bisectopelta, quote unquote, endocranial casts. Hmm. And it was written by Ivan Kuzmin and others and published in Biological Communications. And bisectopelta, if you're not familiar, is a late Cretaceous ankylosaurid, which was found in Uzbekistan. In this case, the endocranial casts include more than just the brain. They also include the inner ear and a whole bunch of blood vessels oh, fun. all over the place. Yeah, it's really cool. So the model looks really interesting. Basically, you've got the typical brain shape, which if you're not familiar with bird brains, they're not shaped like ours, which are kind of boring and just kind of a oblong shape. They have big bulges sticking off the front and the sides and the back and stuff. Depending on which senses they have heightened, they tend to have a big bump <laughs> coming out of the front for smell as well if it's an animal that can smell really well which was the case with this ankylosaur and then the blood vessels all around it are really cool because especially on the top it reminds me of one of those like bird's nest style egg noodle dish things there's just like a crazy mess of these blood vessels sitting on top of the brain and because it's on top of the brain, it would have been nearer to the skin on top of the head, which would have been useful to prevent the brain from overheating. Because I think we've mentioned before that Ankylosaurus had a ton of armor all over its body and it had a very thick bone and stuff like that. So in order to keep its brain from overheating, it had to have like these radiator style blood vessels that could get blood near to the surface so the brain didn't overheat because apparently that's a bad thing to happen. <laughs> It could have also been used for warming up as well. So if, say, it's cold out, but it goes into the sun and its skin starts to warm up, it could pump some blood up there in order to heat up its brain. The researchers describe the blood vessels as being able to flow in different directions, describing them as a system of railway tracks that can redistribute blood as needed, which I think is really fun. They also say that it allowed for precise temperature control and the exact arrangement of the blood vessels is a little bit more like modern lizards than modern birds or crocodiles. So they argued that maybe this is like an ancestral trait going way back that dinosaurs had, but then later got lost as they evolved into birds. Who knows, maybe because birds are smaller and less armored, <laughs> so they didn't need these kinds of things. It reminded me a lot of Casey Holliday et al.'s paper showing the dorsotemporal fossa that we talked about a while back. They especially talked about them on archosaurs like Displetosaurus and T-Rex. Brian Eng also is it featuring quite a bit in this episode. <laughs> had some cool art showing a sort of thermal image version of these dinosaurs using this series of blood vessels on top of the head in a similar way, maybe while basking in order to warm up. And then they could use that if they needed a bunch of energy. Having warm blood is helpful. So it's the same kind of idea, but in this case with ankylosaurs. As far as bisectipelta is concerned in particular, the parts of the brain that are dedicated to smell are very big, so it probably had a really good sense of smell. Maybe it was good for finding wildfires or tasty plants, like we were talking about last week. And it also reminded me of Spike from Land Before Time, because stegosaurs are closely related mm -hmm. <laughs> to ankylosaurs, and they showed him sniffing a lot. I don't know if you remember. He was like always smelling leaves and like finding them and stuff. Oh, I remember him eating everything. He did that too, but he had to sniff them to oh, find them. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I guess if you had a really good sense of smell, maybe you could smell some leaves from a distance. I'm not sure. One last thing that they were able to tell specifically about Bisectopelta is that it had an inner ear with a hearing range of between 100 and 3,000 hertz. It's quite a range. Well, it's a lot less than our range. Our range is more like 100 to 20,000 hertz. But humans have a remarkable sense of hearing compared to most animals, or at least range of hearing, maybe not necessarily acuity. But one thing that it means is that these dinosaurs probably vocalized in that range because animals typically hear in the same range that they make sounds in obviously, because if you're trying to listen to other animals of your species, you need to be able to hear the noises they're making. So it gives us an idea of what kind of frequencies they were making noises at. It's not too surprising because they're pretty big. So lower pitch is generally what you expect. Bigger animals tend to make lower pitch sounds. And in this case, that frequency range of 100 to 3000 hertz is pretty similar to a modern crocodile. So 
maybe some of those creepy, blow, growly, boomy noises that crocodiles make is sort of in the range of what ankylosaurs were doing. Well, that'd be interesting if it turned out that herbivorous dinosaurs like ankylosaurs sounded more like crocodiles, and then the carnivores like T-Rex sounded more like a bird. <laughs> I think most people think the large carnivores probably also were deep, but yeah. it would be hilarious if T-Rex was like chirping. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be cool if we could find a syrinx or one of their vocalizing organs fossilized so we could try to do some analysis of it. Mm -hmm. I think the closest we've ever done is maybe Parasaurolophus with the resonating chamber, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of speculation there because it's not a lot of soft tissue that got preserved, but hopefully someday. There's always more fossils and preserved things to find. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure 100 years ago, they would have been amazed that we could figure out the frequencies that they could hear. Mm -hmm. So who knows how long it'll be until we figure out the frequencies that they made. And any kind of tissue that's been found. Yeah. And blood vessels. Indeed. Especially with CT scans, they didn't even have to cut it open to find them. In other news... So according to NPR, about a third of the museums in the U.S. may permanently close this year. Oh, no. That's based on a survey of 760 museum directors who said that there's a, quote unquote, significant risk of closing permanently by next fall. Oh, that's terrible. However, many of those museums, it said, will have reopened by the end of July. And many of them provided educational resources to students while closed. So that's good. And... I should say there's a significant risk. That doesn't mean that they definitely will close. Mm. But the problem is that museums get most of their funding from ticket and gift shop sales and school trips and museum events, which is obviously hard to do right now. Yeah, especially the thing about field trips. If mu if schools are closed, there aren't any field trips happening. Mm -hmm. And then nobody to buy the dinosaurs in the gift shops. Oh, we got to go to more gift shops. I love it. I need to update my wardrobe with some more dinosaur t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. It sounds like a lot of it's up in the air and there's a lot of planning going on. But hopefully it, that turns out to not be the case. I know a lot of museums do get government funding as well. Like if it's a state museum or affiliated with a university or things like that, those might be in better shape. So that was part of what this article was talking about, is that a lot of people think that they get a lot of funding from the government, but they end up getting most of it through ticket sales and mm. school trips and events and things like that. Well, hopefully they can bounce back. Yes, but on the bright side, uh, in Dinosaur, Colorado, visitors can now sign up for time tickets at the Quarry Exhibit Hall at Dinosaur National Monument. Nice. Tickets cost a whole dollar, plus parking. <laughs> Why is it so cheap? <laughs> Maybe because it's public? I don't really know. But other parts of the monument are open. They're accessible without tickets. And that's if you want to river raft or hike or camp or drive or stargaze. But since the exhibit hall is kind of indoors, or maybe it was all indoors, I can't remember exactly. It's all indoors. It's all indoors? Okay. Yeah, then that's why you need the time tickets, so that you have a certain number of people in there at a, at a time. I guess indoors is kind of a, it's more of like in lean-to than indoors because the the one entire side of it is exposed rock mm -hmm. and then there's a roof and three walls that go with it and maybe a floor <laughs> sort of but there is quite a bit of airspace in there and i know that's the main concern right now mm -hmm. one of the coolest dinosaur sites there is though oh yeah definitely recommend going if you ever get a chance in st paul minnesota there's going to be a dinosaur adventure drive through for two weekends so this weekend, July 31st uh, through next weekend, August 9th or so, you can drive through and see T-Rex, Brachiosaurus, Triceratops, Velociraptor, Stegosaurus, and then you follow along with a custom audio guide. And dino trainers are also there to bring out baby dinosaurs to your car. Nice. Little puppets, I'm assuming. Probably. We've got some Jurassic World news. So Bryce Dallas Howard shared some photos on Twitter. She's gotten some bruises already doing stunt work for Jurassic World Dominion. Wow. She wrote, raise your hands if you're happy to be doing stunts again. And bruises are so large. So she holding up a hand, but covered in bruises. I think she's holding up both hands. And yeah, you see bruises <laughs> on her arms and shoulders. And But she's happy about it, apparently. She is, yeah. I, it's probably pretty exhilarating doing your own stunts. I think I would sign up for it even if I got some bruises. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised, though, because a lot of times they don't let stars do their own stunts since it's risky. 
Well, I know Chris Pratt did a lot of the stunts in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Because hmm. there was that behind the scenes. And Bryce Dallas Howard. She was riding the T-Rex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That was a pretty good one. Yeah. It probably feels good, too, when you see the final movie with all the effects and everything, and you know I did that stunt. Yeah, that's not just a stunt double. Mm -hmm. Pretending you get credit for all the good stuff. <laughs> exactly. In other Jurassic World Jurassic Park news, in August, the Jurassic Park trilogy is coming back to Netflix. I couldn't find out too many details if this is a U.S.-only thing or... You can access it from any country. I think it's still available in Canada or maybe the UK. I can't remember. But I remember seeing recently that it was still available somewhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> not the US. And then it's been in the US before in the past. It just keeps bouncing around, I guess, as different rights yeah. trade to hands. Well, hopefully it sticks around for a long time and then it's in multiple countries. Yeah. And then last... The trailer for Jurassic World Camp Cretaceous is out. That's also going to be on Netflix. And we talked about this before. It's going to be about a group of teens. They go to a dinosaur camp. And then, of course, life finds a way. The dinosaurs escape. And now the teens have to find a way to survive. The animation looks pretty fun. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they combine kids show style children animations with dinosaurs eating people. <laughs> I wonder how kid-friendly it'll be. It looked like it was stylized in a kid-friendly way, but I don't know. Well, the main characters are teens, so maybe older kids. And I imagine you can get a lot more creative with the dinosaurs. Yeah. And what's going on. I suppose all the Jurassic Park movies are PG-13, so maybe that still works. I saw Jurassic Park when I was seven. I was scared, <laughs> but I watched it. That's true. It is dinosaurs, so mm -hmm. it does happen. Well, we'll be keeping an eye out for when that comes to Netflix. And now for our dinosaur of the day, Daemonosaurus, which was a request from Ewan via our Discord and Patreon, so thanks. Daemonosaurus was a basal theropod that lived in the late Triassic in what is now New Mexico in the U.S. in the Chinle Formation at Ghost Ranch. There's some estimates that it was about 5 feet or 1.5 meters long, and there's other estimates that it was 7 feet or two and a half meters long and weighed 49 pounds or 22 kilograms. It was probably about the same height as a tall dog. The skull of Daemonosaurus was about five and a half inches or 14 centimeters long, and it had these very large eye sockets. The skull was short and there were long teeth, and that was different from other early theropods, which had long heads and jaws. Daemonosaurus was a carnivore and it had serrated teeth, and it had large premaxillary and maxillary teeth in the upper jaw, so it had basically large front teeth. The first two teeth in the lower jaw are also pretty large. Hmm. Almost like tusks in the front there. More like buck teeth. <laughs> oh. We'll get to that in a minute. But, but I had heterodont teeth, though, different shaped teeth throughout the mouth. Oh, and the premaxilla, the tip of the upper jaw, and the front upper, the anterior maxillary jaw teeth were very large compared to the back upper, the posterior maxillary teeth. Weird. Mm hmm Like many dinosaurs, it was weird. <laughs> Hans Dieter Seuss said that the large front teeth were good for seizing and killing prey, and it probably had a powerful bite because of the short, deep snout. That's according to Live Science. Only the holotype of Daemonosaurus has been found. And that holotype includes a nearly complete skull, vertebrae, and ribs. The skull was nearly complete, but it was crushed. So the type species is Daemonosaurus chaliotis, and the genus name means demon lizard, and that refers to the legends about evil spirits at Ghost Ranch, which is where it was found. The species name means buck-toothed, or prominent-toothed, or outstanding teeth. Hmm. Again, because it had the large teeth. There's a lot of difference between outstanding teeth and buck-toothed. <laughs> True. <laughs> I like to think of it as buck-tooth. Yeah. The fossils were found by E.H. Colbert in the 1980s, and it was found in a block of mudstone, and that mudstone was on loan from Carnegie Museum to the State Museum of Pennsylvania, and then visitors were able to watch volunteers prepare the rock, and a volunteer found the Daemonosaurus skull. And it was named in 2011 by Hans Dieter Seuss and others. It's unclear if the holotype is an adult or a juvenile, because it had these large eye sockets and no fused bones between the brain case bones that made it seem like a juvenile. But then there's sutures on the vertebrae near the skull that are closed, and that's like an adult. Daemonosaurus was 
found with fossils of coelophysis. Colbert said in 1989 that Daemonosaurus and a few coelophysis were washed into a small pond and then they drowned and were buried quickly after. Daemonosaurus lived in a warm monsoon-like climate with a lot of rain. There was a lot of prey around, a lot of animals in general, so coelophysis, reptiles, fish, and vegetation included conifers, ferns, and horsetails. A lot of animals, again, were found close together, and that's probably because of a flash flood. Before Daemonosaurus was found, there was a gap in the mid-Triassic, and paleontologists thought that these early carnivores had gone extinct, and now they know that they were diverse and they lived in the late Triassic. So Daemonosaurus helps show the diversity of early theropods, as well as the fact that theropods had different skull shapes. These different skull shapes meant that they had different feeding strategies, and that made it easy to coexist. Daemonosaurus then helps show the link between basal and later theropods. So based on its features, Daemonosaurus looks like a mix of early theropods like Eodromaeus from South America and more advanced theropods like Tawa, which is also from Ghost Ranch. But it lived after both Eodromaeus and Tawa, so that's very strange. And it probably means that Daemonosaurus came from early theropods that came to North America and then lived alongside newer evolving theropods. That makes it a ghost lineage, potentially, from Ghost Ranch. Oh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> so one of these features is the cavities on some of the neck vertebrae that are related to the structure of the respiratory system, according to Hans-Dieter Seuss, which is the type of respiratory system that we see in neotheropods and modern birds. So we were talking about with Dilophosaurus earlier. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, to your point on ghost lineages, Hans-Dieter Seuss said that Daemonosaurus may be part of a dinosaur lineage that didn't evolve later in the Mesozoic. And Daemonosaurus fossils are now in the collection of the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And our fun fact of the day is a little follow-up from last week's charcoal-eating Borealopelta, because I was thinking about that again when we were going through this Bisectipelta and how it could smell really well, and maybe that led it to eating some forest fire materials. Anyway, <laughs> there are other animals that take advantage of forest fires in relation to eating either charcoal or ash. <laughs> so monkeys on the African island Zanzibar eat charcoal, presumably to counteract the effects of poisons in their food. Oh, so they specifically eat food that has poison in it. Yes. So there are these leaves which are high in protein and therefore good to eat, but they also happen to have poison on them. <laughs> and rather than just finding something else to eat, they're on an island, there might not be a lot of options. So instead they eat charcoal, which is also in some forms known as activated carbon. And in that form, it absorbs or absorbs, if you're being less technically correct, <laughs> some of the toxins and therefore it doesn't poison the monkey that wants to eat the leaves. I wonder how long it took the monkeys to figure that out. It is very much one of those things where which monkey figured this situation out. Mm -hmm. It's pretty crazy. But it works. That was the only example I could find of an animal eating charcoal because charcoal was the thing that Borealopelta had in its gut contents. And I don't know, maybe Borealopelta was eating something poisonous and it was smart enough to know that it should eat charcoal as well. But I don't know, Borealopelta probably wasn't that bright. And Kylosaurus really aren't that smart, so I don't know. They could have gotten lucky and one f did it accidentally and then noticed a benefit and it spread that way or Maybe. something. Maybe. I think it's more likely that it was eating a bunch of ferns and accidentally, because there were like twigs and stuff in there too that weren't charcoal. Right. It seems more likely that it was just accidentally eating charcoal, but could be. We don't know. On the other hand, there are a lot of animals that have been observed eating ash. So charcoal is chunky black pieces. If you have a fireplace and you kind of let it burn out before it burns through all the wood completely, you'll have these big ch black chunks of charcoal. And those are hydrocarbons that aren't completely burned away. So there's still a lot of carbon in that. And it gets really porous. And the porosity of that hydrocarbon is what adsorbs the toxins or just any chemicals which happen to be around it and the right size to get stuck. On the other hand, ash is fluffy and dusty. If you fully burn down a fire to nothing or you cremate something, you're basically only left with ash. And by the time it's ash, virtually all of the hydrocarbons have been fully burnt away. So there's no carbon left at all, or there shouldn't be any carbon left at all because it's all turned into carbon dioxide and gone up through a chimney. 
or <laughs> up through the forest canopy, <laughs> as the case may be. So apparently deer frequently come around to investigate smoke when something's burning and they have been observed many times eating wood ash. The main reason for this seems to be that ash is high in lots of useful minerals because once all the carbon is burned out of it, you're left with the other nutrients which the plants have absorbed while they were alive. And wood ash is usually very high in calcium and phosphorus. So these are pretty helpful minerals. You need a lot of calcium in order to grow bone, potentially also horns. If you're a buck (laughs) that needs to grow a big rack of antlers. And I immediately saw a connection here to hadrosaurs because we talked about those hadrosaurs that were found probably having eaten rotten wood to get at the calcium invertebrates that were in there. So maybe hadrosaurs, if they found some ash, might snack on that as well to get some of the additional calcium. Or frankly, any dinosaur because they all laid hard-shelled eggs. So all of the female dinosaurs should be excited if they could find some ash to (laughs) chomp down as long as it had the right balance of minerals in it. But real quick, for the record, I want to point out charcoal is not a nutritious supplement. There are lots of things online that claim that eating activated charcoal is somehow good for you because it binds to toxins in your body and will have these myriad of health benefits. That is all nonsense because, in fact, activated carbon binds to just about everything, all sorts of different molecules that it runs into, including all sorts of vitamins. (laughs) So if you eat a bunch of activated carbon and something with a bunch of vitamins in it, it's possible that the activated carbon is just going to absorb all the vitamins and you won't get any of those into your bloodstream where you want them. So it doesn't discriminate between good and bad chemicals. Activated carbon doesn't care. It just absorbs everything. (laughs) So don't eat activated charcoal unless there is one example when you should, which is when someone gets poisoned. If you go to the ER because you're poisoned and you still have a bunch of the stuff in your GI tract, sometimes they'll put a whole bunch of activated charcoal into your GI tract to absorb the poison before it's absorbed by your guts. So that is one medical use for it. But just on like a day-to-day basis activated charcoal doesn't make any sense because you're going to be absorbing a lot of stuff you want to eat you just don't eat poisonous stuff then you don't need to eat activated charcoal don't don't be like the monkeys on zanzibar yes we don't have to eat poison leaves there's no reason to get activated charcoal into your body is activated charcoal the same as activated carbon yeah so basically charcoal if you burn it down you're mostly left with carbon because you you burn it in an oxygen depleted environment. So most of the hydrogen comes off on it. And yeah, so it should be basically carbon when you're done, but usually they call it activated charcoal. But yeah, I think activated carbon is a synonym. Otherwise I'm wrong and just pretend I said activated charcoal every time. (laughs) All right. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss out on any new episodes. And join our community, patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.